prepare your bodies and your minds because today on Roll for Crit, we are reviewing the game Deep Madness from Dimension Games, which is a cooperative sci-fi horror title set in the depths of the earth. There's monsters, there's water, there's horror, there's all kinds of terrible tragedies waiting to occur. Yes, in this game, you take on the role of six investigators who have entered the Kadath Mining Facility, which is deep under the ocean. And if you can't tell from the state of the board we have set up here, it's not going too well. Uh, you have to control these investigators to complete specific scenarios, which will be in the book, which will tell you a little backstory, as well as tell you how to set up the game board and what's going on. Yeah, uh, basically the way that it works, the turns between the players and the monsters are kind of intertwined. There's not specific phases for each. So yeah, as you can see down there, it actually zigzags. You alternate, a player goes, a specific investigator, then a specific monster, etc., and you keep going back and forth. Obviously you skip a monster if there isn't any instance of that one on the board. Uh, and then new ones will spawn at the end of the round. So everybody goes, everybody gets- Start of the round. It depends on how you look at You're it. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Everybody goes, uh, you have three actions on your turn, and you can divide them between different things. So, of course, you can do a move action, which is just moving into an adjacent space. That's an obvious one. Uh, if there's monsters there, you'll have to deal with getting past them. Uh, that's a whole other thing you have to check for your uh, escape points and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, you can go into combat with a monster. So depending on your character, you're going to have different items and weapons that will let you roll certain amounts of dice. And it's one of those sort of uh, skill check systems where you're going to need to hit a certain number. It depends on the weapon. Yeah, in fact, like most of the, like Arkham Horror, when we talk about skill check, it is the five and sixes right. are your successes. Hence, right. they have those extra little symbols on there. Exactly. So for each one of those you succeed on, you get a hit on them, etc. cetera. Uh, you can also search. Uh, for whatever space that you're in, which is taking a card from the deck and get a new item, which is very important because you really want to stock up on different kinds of weapons and things. If you're in a space with another player, uh, you can trade items that you found with them. You think there's a weapon that works better for them, etc. And then there are specific things you can do on the board where you may need to pick up special components uh, that are specific to the scenario. And finally, there are these doors which you can actually lock. So you can try to stop monsters from getting through them so they have to break that door down, maybe buy you a little time before you move on. So usually each scenario presents you with a specific goal and you're trying to accomplish that goal before uh, the end of that track is reached or before one of you dies. Uh, and more monsters, as we said, are spawning, so they're always going to be an issue. You're going to have to deal with them, but you're kind of balancing your time between attacking them and trying to actually beat the scenario before you get overrun. Yeah, as we said, this is a cropper game, so your biggest opponent is the game itself. The way the game's going to fight back is each turn, you're going to move along this dial, and if you take too long and this reaches the end, it's game over. Depending on the symbol, certain things occur. These red ones are generic. That just means a room gets devoured. What that happens is you'll draw a card from this deck. It'll show a room number. In this case, it's five down there. We're not going to do it because that's hard to reach. But you'll <laughs> actually flip it. And that room now has been devoured. It's sort of corrupted. You'll add a spawn place as well as some of those uh, tokens over there, which pretty much add bad effects if you end your turn there. Some of them are worse than others. In addition, then you'll spawn monsters, depending on the number in the top corner. Uh, you'll draw a card for each there. So if it's a three, you'll draw three cards. And each card can tell you to spawn multiple monsters. This one will tell you to spawn two deliriums in two different rooms, which you'll use from this deck. They'll only spawn in the already corrupted rooms. Mm -hmm. Finally, the monsters themselves will spawn at high rates. They all have unique abilities and will actually be stronger if they're in corrupted rooms. Some of them will try to drag you towards them. Some of them will spawn these little crab-like monsters, so they're pretty much a mobile spawning point. And as you said earlier, they'll break down the doors, meaning that door can no longer be locked until you repair it. So the game is going to throw everything it has at you. Yeah, and we also didn't even cover the, probably the other biggest thing, which is the flooding mechanic. That's right. We're underwater. So <laughs> yeah. some rooms, in this case, this side of the board, uh, is flooded. What happens there is everyone has their own auction tile. And anytime you take an action in a, dr a flooded, drowned room, uh, you go down. And as you start running out of auction, you could you might have to start taking damage. Do too much, you die. Yeah. Now, once you end your turn, if you end your turn in a non-flooded room, you go straight up to six. So you're exactly. 
So take a deep breath. <laughs> yeah, so it can get really hard really fast. It's a challenging, punishing game. There's no doubt about it. Also, as you go, there's going to be different effects. Of course, you have you know a health level. Uh, there's also sanity tokens, which you, everybody has their own special abilities that involve those usually. Yeah, unlike Arkham or any of the Elder, uh, the Arkham line, where your sanity is pretty much just another health bar. The way it works in this is you, it's pretty more like a mana bar where you can exhaust the sanity, you get a token. Mm -hmm. And, for example, this character has five. Once he has five, he can't do anything until he gets rid of it. So you can take a rest action and remove them all. Right. But when you defeat a monster, you have to flip over madness tokens depending on how difficult or terrifying the monster is. And if you have three madness tokens, you return them all and draw a card from this madness deck, which are usually very bad things, but has this... A huge amount of flavor text, which we'll get to in a second, which is amazing because if you defeat a monster and you can't flip over a madness token, for each one you can't flip over, you draw on these conscious cards, which have all this flavor text about what's been going on in the facility and, of course, have positive effects. Some of them are right away like discard a madness token or could be keep this card to add one to a die roll. Right. So some very important things to keep track of. Yeah, so this was a Kickstarter-launched game. It's a big game. It's got a lot of minis. Right now, this is all basic enemies. It comes with a couple of these major enemies which you'll meet through the story. Much bigger minis with their own little card. Right. And some have their own little token things, too, because, you know, you can't have a unique giant boss without their own little weird mechanic. (laughs) So, yeah, there's definitely a lot to dissect. And as we said, each scenario has its own unique kind of goals that you're trying to reach, which come with their own. Like, sometimes they have kind of generic tokens, like something you'd see in, like, Mansions of Madness or a Descent, where things that stand in, and each time they might represent something different or Mm -hmm. a different goal, which which is always appreciated and cool. And Uh, the characters themselves, I know there's some, I think uh, you actually have some of them from of you instead of me oh no like i have a good one arthur wayland mm-hmm. if you uh don't get a, like alien reference i believe like the, uh, once in there had the dunnage facility or section of the facility and stuff yeah there. it's not strictly like it's based in lovecraft but clearly inspired by it uh, we always reference bioshock dead space uh i think that game soma the vi- in the video game mm-hmm. world also it's very much that kind of like dark horror, gruesome, grim. And in terms of capturing the feeling and the atmosphere and, like, theme, it does that so well. The conscious cards reading, like, it feels like when you find a log in a video game, it's not specifically for that moment, but it's like something that happened there maybe a while back or one person's experience of trying to get away from a monster. It's amazing how it does that, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. But it also captures the horror of being in this kind of scenario. In most of those video games, you can do uh, difficulty settings. This has one, (laughs) punishing. (laughs) Yeah, it is pretty rough. If you are going, you are definitely gonna be playing these scenarios multiple times. And that is one of my criticisms of the game, I think, to start off with is, I feel like, Uh, I feel like it was not designed for each player to have one investigator to play with six, I mean. I feel like two or three is optimal because there are a lot of times where in order to execute your plan well, your turn it just can be move, move, pick a thing, and then you're done, you're out for a while. It's I feel like it's very easy to just kind of be a cog in a plan rather than feeling like you're your own person well, and you're doing something. Yeah, your in thing. particular, because the game's so difficult, a lot of it feels like even before the game starts, like once you set everything up. You need a good solid like five, ten minutes, everyone discussing how do we solve this within that time period. Yeah, that's right. They do have these syringe cards, which are apparently supposed to be, I think it's the more prepared mode, where everyone gets one of these and supposed to be helpful. But even with that, you're gonna have our time. If you go to the board game geek page for this, there are a lot of suggestions of how people have made it easier of like maybe the four is a success as well or doing this around though there was also one person who said the game wasn't hard enough for him I want to meet this person <laughs> that's yeah that's now that's some deep madness <laughs> um, and uh, and of course there's a lot of dice rolling in particular we ran into some things like for instance in the first scenario where you're trying to research these clues and you just have to roll one die and get a five or a six on it and you need to do that three times to pick up this clue. Jonathan, who is controlling three characters, and each one has three chances at it, 
failed nine times. <laughs> so it can be tedious. And if you like, if you're someone who has played Arkham Horror and you feel like that's too much randomness for you, you shouldn't even come near this game. Yeah, in particular, one <laughs> With of the dice rolls specifically. Yeah. Well, one of the things in Arkham Horror is the item deck. I feel like there's usually a good amount of weapons and also cards that maybe give extra actions or help with the ho- things like that. This most of this deck I feel is I is weapon based. Probably because so many monsters spawn to deal with them, and there's some mm-hmm. awesome weapons in there. It's not just like oh you got to hope for that one good weapon. No, you can get like in essence a mini gun really <laughs> early on or a sniper rifle, like all yeah. these awesome weapons. But in terms of helping with that role, I think there's like a handful that will help with the actual completion of the activity. It definitely could have used more variety in that deck. I do really like like the items that are in there. You do feel really cool and powerful for getting them. I wish that some of them were maybe worded a little more clearly as to so- sometimes the card wording is a little ambiguous, but uh, in general, they're well designed, I think. Yeah, and the mecha- like the drown mechanic's so cool. The yeah. idea of having to think like, oh, go around here because you're holding your breath and then going out to have this wheel. And in that sense, it's not very punishing in the surprising that when you end your turn, you go straight up six, not just go up like two. Right, <laughs> a little bit nicer on that front. Uh, the devouring, I think, is a really great idea. In practice, I think we found that uh, things got just devoured so quickly. And <laughs> well, that, that the it, other issue is because you spawn so many tokens so quickly and monster minis, then like flipping this thing, oh yeah, <laughs> could be quite a hassle. But it, it almost feels like it might as well have just been devoured already because right. I'm like, we, we, you play so cautiously from the start. But I do think as a concept. That that the devouring and the flooding are definitely the things that make this stand out from other games of this genre. Well, and, and it's di- I think it's difficult because for some people that's great. The play order I also think is kind of cool. Each each round you actually uh, push one to the end and slide them up, so it's not always identical, and that's fun to well, kind of be like. I think the, you're going before this monster. No, the, the big thing is go? really not just there's the monster phase; it's that it's the hysteria's turn or the husk's turn. Right. So there's a lot more planning you can do where it doesn't feel as bad like uh, some games where you can't change player order in this because you know their turn order you can think like okay we have to have you kill that husk because if you kill it that gives us a whole free action yeah yeah which is, I think, really important and help, especially in a difficult, in a difficult game. I definitely think overall that that the as you started with, the theme is very well executed. I will say, I know you really like the consciousness cards. I love the way they're written. I just, I wish they were like the effect had anything to do with what you. No, I completely with. understand. Yeah, but like, I, 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 I don't know. Some, I just sometimes I feel like I just read a wall of text and then it's like. Get rid of the madness token. Oh, I don't have any. And I feel like I wasted my time a little mm. bit. That's me. I, I, I get where you're coming from with that. But still, like, just because that theme of reading, like, that's my favorite thing of playing a game like FOD or something is finding those weird small It's definitely inserts. cool, I think, the first time you play. I feel like when you're going the third time through the scenario, guess you're probably like, sometimes, yeah. Okay, okay, I get it. I definitely think these people have some amazing writers backing them. But the difficulty definitely was one that, that they could have maybe looked into adjusting a bit more somehow. Because, as we said, this game is definitely unbelievably punishing. Crits and misses for deep madness. Crits. It's a heavily thematic and flavorful game. Every monster, every detail, every card is dripping with theme and dark artwork to enhance your spooky experience. From the intros and the winning paragraphs that they give for each scenario, as well as the conscious cards and madness cards. If you're looking for good story around each turn, this game will provide it. If you're someone who appreciates a good challenge in your co-op board games, this one is definitely going to do that for you. If you like using the phrase, get good, this game will ask you to put your money where your mouth is. There's a good deal of content here, including the scenarios themselves, but also in terms of components, the variety of miniatures and different enemies and weapons available. The game is ambitious and it introduces some really cool and interesting mechanics, including the way that the turn order works and even bigger things such as the way room tiles are devoured or flooded. Now let's get devoured and find out Deep Madness's misses. This is probably one of the most difficult games we have played. This can be especially compounded when it comes to the randomness of dice rolls, and can almost feel impossible to beat if you don't adjust the rules. If you like a good challenge, you're going to get it, but man, it can feel really punishing, really difficult, and uh, honestly unfair. 
The game is designed that there should always be six investigators out, which may sound like it'd be perfect for a six player game, but because there's so much planning and honestly, agreeing with what you're going to do beforehand, your turn can feel really short if you only control one investigator. Definitely, you probably want to have two or three players, not too much more than that. This game gives you a lot to play with, but that means also a lot to keep track of. There are monsters spawning, a plenty of tokens on the board, rooms flipping, and six investigators. There are definitely times where we just forgot the tokens needed to be moved or flipped or revealed. There's so much that you have to do in between everyone's turn to keep track of. The item deck is mostly weapon. While there is a lot of plenty strong ones, such as the sniper rifle we've mentioned, there aren't a lot of items that help you with non-combat related objectives. This can be a real pain, especially if the objectives rely on dice rolls. Some more variety would have been appreciated. Deep Madness is unquestionably an ambitious game. It's a large game, and if you're someone who really likes this type of horror theme, I think you're going to get a lot out of it, as long as you are prepared for that difficulty. Unfortunately for myself personally, I just think that there are a lot of times where it felt tedious to play, and in a world where you have Arkham Horror uh, to play as opposed to this, it's hard for me to really recommend it to anyone unless, as I said, you're someone who's already played those games and you just love this genre so much that you want to jump into it. I did back this, so I'm sure there's part of me that's a sort of little backers, you know, right. don't want to. <laughs> but I do love the theme a lot, and I like I loved Bioshock, Dead Space, and this, this captures that so well, especially the Conscious Dead to me learning little bits about the lore and luckily because it's a cooperative game you know you just like i said go on the board game geek website there are plenty of ways you can adjust it to make the game a lot easier but once again we're here to review it for what is provided in the base mm -hmm. and i think that's the issue like their way to make the game easier the syringes i felt like was not something i actually wanted to use that often when we even we use them mm -hmm. you know when something compared to maybe adjusting die rolls or monster spawns would be a lot easier and the other thing is, this is a big miniatures game, so you're already taking a big, big hit to your wallet. And the expansions are really cool, and they're going to add things, I think, that will be overall more helpful for you. But once again, that's in an expansion. Yeah, I, it seems like the game's gotten pretty positive reception from people online that I've seen. So uh, I don't know, maybe uh, we're in the minority, me especially, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, de I definitely, I think because it's so expensive, it's a good reason where if you have the chance, read up a lot on it, try it out if you can, because if you do end up spending money on it and you don't like it, well, actually, it probably has pretty good resale value, so you could <laughs> give it to someone else. <laughs> well, like, for me, I still came out having fun when I lost them, but, uh, most of them. I mean, sometimes you're like, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> but compared to other games, because it's the cooperative game in a way that unlike maybe something that's a legacy where there's a campaign, I can go back and replay the scenario and be like, okay, so this, it's like a extremely difficult puzzle. Problem is, it does seem like sometimes, unless you get every move right, mm -hmm. you're in deep trouble, pun <laughs> <Yeah>. intended. <laughs> so uh, we're a little bit divided on this one. Let us know what you think. Maybe you are a backer of Deep Madness. Maybe you've had a chance to play it with or without the expansions. Uh, maybe you've actually managed to beat more of the scenarios than we've been able if to. You're, if you're that one person who thinks the game's too easy, <laughs> I'd love to hear from you. Uh, yeah, let us know in the comments down below. Please, please, please. Or ask us any other kinds of questions, suggestions for a future review, anything that you like. And if you haven't played the game yet or you want to introduce it to your friends, we'll have a how to play out as well on our channel that hopefully will help with some of those uh, fiddlier bits that you got to keep track yep. of. Yep, <laughs> we're even going to punish ourselves through that. <laughs> that's right. Uh, otherwise, that's going to be it for this review. Mm -hmm. I'm Jonathan. I'm Will. And this is Roll for Crit. Don't forget to click that like button and of course subscribe for even more excellent videos. I subscribed and now I'm rich.